Today's reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. This is out of the New International Version of Scripture. Jesus predicts his death a second time. They left that place, and passing through Galilee, Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. When they came to Capernaum, he was in the house, and he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child who had, whom, he'd been, whom he placed amongst them, excuse me, taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The scriptures revealing God, the scriptures revealing the word of God to the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. For a guy who has to talk for a living, I sure am tongue tied today, and I'm not sure why. I apologize to you all. In the chapter before this one, Jesus asked his disciples, and you may remember this from last week, who do you say I am? And Peter, on a rare occasion, actually got it right. You are the Christ, he said. What does that mean, really? Well, I imagine that most of us would, this morning, would uh, give Jesus the same answer, that you are the Christ. But really, what does that mean? Well, Jesus, he says to his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. Instead, instead of asking Christ about it, they're walking down the road and they're doing what? Arguing amongst themselves. And what are they arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? It's then written that sitting down, Jesus called the twelve. Now this is a phrase that a lot of people miss. Sitting down. It's an important phrase. It's an indication that it's a teaching moment because when a rabbi would sit, it was a teaching moment for his students. So this was a teaching moment. A teaching moment of great importance. You see, what Jesus is going to tell them, this is central to what it means to follow Jesus. It goes to the core of the meaning of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what it means to live in the kingdom of God, and what it means to be the church. It also shows how radically revolutionary Jesus' teachings are. I mean, he's one of the, this, it's one of the greatest turn, uh, overturnings of history, what he's about to say. All of our assumed ideas about importance, our assumed ideas about greatness, are going to vanish into dust. All our boasting and, and the pomp and circumstance of power become irrelevant. Basically, Jesus just stopped the entire human race and slammed it into reverse. Indeed, what Jesus says is so upsetting by society's views, some people might literally stagger at the thought of accepting it as our way of life. Clearly, Jesus' disciples 
Well, they had thought of their, their calling to follow Christ as an opportunity for privilege, power, and position. Because at this point, discipleship meant service. But service to them. The last thing they could think about is the kind of sacrificial outpouring of self that Jesus is all about. That the Christ, that the cross is all about. That being a Christian is all about. And this confusion, this case of missing the point, which is something that his disciples did quite often if you actually read scripture, this case of missing the point has continued down through the ages, people. How hard it is for people to accept a crucified Lord instead of a conquering king. How reluctant we are to accept the cross of Jesus as the supreme revelation of God. But if we do, if we do make a detour around the cross, we miss the way to God entirely. Like the disciples, how many of us have been afraid to ask of the meaning of Christ's death? Afraid because of what the answer might be. That we just might end up getting in too deep. Because the answer makes the acceptance of the cross the law for our lives. The answer means that everything, everything must change. It points to the extreme. It's dangerous. It's, it upsets everything. It isn't comfortable. Yes, it's about living life as a sacrifice of giving our minds, our hearts, our time, and our strength as a ransom for others. It's hardcore. In a world in love with itself where we're told that it's okay, actually, you know, it's great to promote ourselves. The disciples look pretty normal, don't they? Arguing amongst themselves about who's the greatest. For millennia, people have thought or fought about who will be the greatest. And these arguments have moved, moved us from the simple bow and arrow to atomic bombs. And because of this, nations and people stand in ruins. All of us, all of us, are continually bombarded with advertising meant to bring to the surface and legitimize envy, covetousness, pride, vanity, and greed. Even education is often just a means to sharpen our claws in battle of competition so we can claw our way to the top. And the urge to be the greatest can even get, yes, inside the church. with the desire for material prosperity and social prestige. Think and shudder at how these things often displace the desire to seek and to serve those who are lost. A poll of tithers in a mainstream denomination revealed that 90% of those who gave, now these are tithers, okay? 90% of those who gave, they expected something in return for their gains. They mentioned, you know, things like snappy sermons or, or rousing choirs and a full range of programs for the family. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with those things. There's absolutely nothing wrong with those things at all. In fact, I will go so far as to say that we should, and we do seek to be the very best that we can be. But very few of the people in the poll mentioned service. And absolutely no one ever mentioned anything about suffering. Jesus asked his disciples, what were you talking about on the road, guys? <clears throat> and this question... This is a question which ought to be truly unsettling. 
What are we discussing as we journey with Jesus? What is the main concern of our conversations? What is the deepest thing in our hearts? What do we care about the most? Are we missing the point? So sitting down, Jesus called the twelve, and Jesus calls you, and Jesus calls me. And he says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be very last, and the servant to all. I want you to imagine something, just for a moment. I want you to imagine that Jesus were to come to our community to pick its leading citizens. Who would they be? Who would they be when measured, if you will, by Jesus' revolutionary standard? Who would they be? Surely the, the majority of his candidates would be the quote-unquote nobodies. People whose names have never been anything more than anything, anything more notorious than listed in a telephone book. Those people who are already written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Perhaps on Jesus' list, you might, you might not find the president of some big corporation, but you might find the president's janitor. Perhaps it would be someone who visits the sick, someone who visits those in prison. Maybe it would be a Sunday school teacher who desires no reward at all, no recognition, but just wants to serve and let others know that they are loved and cared about. Maybe it would be somebody who, who, has, this, who has little but gives much of that little. Would it be someone who smiles despite difficulties in life and thus brightens up another person's day? Could it be someone who prays for others and with others? Could it be the street evangelist or the person who invites others to come to worship God with them at church? Maybe it's the person who takes time out of their busy day to help a stranger who's in distress. Could it be a person with a listening ear, perhaps? Someone who's willing to be present for others during difficult times? Could it be anyone who brings the love of Christ to others in selfless service, without judgment, without self-righteousness? Is it me? Is it you? Well, one way of putting this question to ourselves is, are we living before Christ or after Christ? What do I mean by that? Are, are our ideas of greatness the same as those that we had before we proclaimed Jesus as Lord? Or have things really changed in our minds? <clears throat> it's been said that we often pay lip service to the view that the first shall be last, so long as we're not challenged to put that view into the test of accepting someone who we consider to be a, a real outsider. And one of the most difficult tasks for volunteers at soup kitchens, homeless shelters, and other service organizations is to learn to treat people with dignity. Treat people with dignity as they're helping. So how do we learn to follow Jesus? How do we come to understand the message of the cross? Jesus has the answer. And it comes in a picture lesson. It's written, He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in, their, in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. I think in our society today where children are the apples of our eye, the virtual princes and princesses of the family, we might be apt to miss Jesus' point in this. You see, in Jesus' day, children were not the symbol of innocence. 
like they are, like we think of them today. Instead, they were symbolized, they were the symboliz symbolization of powerlessness, vulnerability. Children were considered non persons. There is very little interest in children in Greco Roman society. Childless Romans who needed heirs often adopted adults rather than children because children with, were without status. They had no power. They could do nothing for themselves. They could do nothing for others. Indeed, in order for a child to survive at all, they must be served and served and served with love. True? So Jesus tells us that whoever welcomes and accepts a powerless person of low status has welcomed him. And whoever welcomes him does not welcome him, but the one who sent him. Let that sink in for just a moment. Who are the powerless? The so-called non-persons in our midst today. Who needs help? Who has been overlooked? Who's hurting? Who's hungry? Who's lonely? Who are we called to welcome and to serve? The child represents Jesus. And anyone who is powerless represents Jesus. And everyone is to be welcomed. The way we treat the least of these is indeed a good measure of our own disciples. There is no worldly profit in serving the so-called useless people of the world, is there? But did not Christ himself come to earth to lay down his very life on a bloody cross in order to welcome you and me? That's the character of God. God serves all people despite our absolute inability to do anything for God. He serves, he, 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 he serves us. He grants us things every day, does he not? Why? <clears throat> and Jesus says that people who treat others as God treats us, they're great. Why is that? Because we are living like God. And God is great. That's my message for this day. Amen. And amen.